So our last speaker is Dan Romick from UC Davis, and he'll be speaking on sorting networks, staircase young to blow, and last passage regulation. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, thank you. Uh, can everybody see and hear me? Um, I'll be talking about joint work with uh, Elia BC, Fabio Kunden, and Shane Gibbons from uh, University College of Dublin. And I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity, especially since I'm the last speaker of the conference. Um, so let me start with an outline of what I'll be talking about. So this talk has kind of a probabilistic flavor. So um, the main thing I'll be describing are a few interesting uh, random processes that show up uh, uh, in the context of uh, random young tableau and random sorting networks. Here are some pictures of these things uh, in case you haven't seen them before, but I'll go into more detail about what they mean. And there's a main kind of new phenomena that I'll be uh, talking about, which is uh, a set of probabilistic uh, identities. There are distributional identities, you know, that one random variable has the same distribution as another random variable, or in some cases, random vectors. Um, and uh, these random quantities kind of are related to the time when these processes terminate. So that's sort of the, the kind of types of quantities we're interested in. Now, um, the connection to combinatorics shows up when you study these identities and it, they tend to lead to very interesting algebraic combinatorial constructions and tools, uh, including ones that we all know and love, such as the RSK correspondence, the Burge correspondence, and the Edelman-Green correspondence. So they all kind of play or have a role to play in this discussion. So I'll start with showing you one of those identities. This is sort of the, the most interesting one, and I think the, the nicest one. Uh, and it has to do with random walks on two graphs. Uh, one of the graphs is uh, the permutahedron. And you know we've heard, we've heard the permutahedron discussed in a bunch of talks, often as a polytope. But in my context, I'm only interested in it as a graph. So you know it's simply the Cayley graph of the symmetric group um, with, the, with the adjacent transpositions as the generators. So it's, you know, it, it can also be referred to as the weak Bruja order. And paths in this uh, graph are what we call reduced words. So the, it's an important graph for sure. Uh, the second graph is uh, slightly less standard. So I denote it by Y of delta N. But what it is, is it's basically a subgraph of the Young graph, which is the graph of all Young diagrams. Uh, in, in our case, we're interested in the all Young diagrams that are contained in a staircase shape. So the staircase shape I label by delta N, and Y of delta N is a subgraph of those Young diagrams. And um, so I um, now define two random variables, uh, which I denote Xn and Yn. And those would be the absorbing times of the continuous time simple random walk on those two on those two graphs. And note that I'm thinking of these graphs as directed graphs, so that's why they are arrows, obviously. Um, and you so you start uh, in each graph. You start at the bottom. So here on the left, you start with the identity permutation, and you start performing adjacent swaps until you reach the farthest point, which is here on the top. Uh, what's called the reverse permutation. And on the right-hand side, you start with the empty Young diagram, and you add one box at a time until you reach the full staircase shape. Um, and you can do that in discrete time, which is sort of the simpler way of doing it. But uh, there's a sort of a canonical way to parameterize time uh, using a continuous variable such that the set of states visited by that continuous time random walk is the ordinary discrete time random walk. And that's sort of a very natural thing to do. And in the probabilistic study of these processes, this is what people usually do. Um, so I've defined now Xn and Yn to be the time when in this continuous parameterization, when both of these processes uh, terminate, meaning reach their absorbing state at the top. And we have a conjecture uh, that says that those two random variables are equal in distribution. Uh, actually, in more recent work, this conjecture is now a theorem. I'll kind of discuss that a little bit at the end. But for now, let's, let's think of it as a conjecture. 
Um, and note that this is not an obvious statement by any means, because these two graphs are different from each other. I mean, they share some, some characteristics. They are both uh, uh, graded lattices and stuff like that. But uh, it's, it's by no means obvious that you would, uh, there's no a priori reason to expect why the termination time would have the same distribution. So that's the sort of thing that I'll try to kind of understand or explain to the extent that we are able to explain it. Uh, now let me backtrack a bit and discuss a bit of background just to frame the discussion a bit more in, in detail. So uh, SYT of delta n is my notation for the set of standard Young tableau of shape delta n, where delta n is the staircase shape with n minus one rows. So, you know, familiar objects that we all know and love. Here's a standard Young tableau here on the right, an example of one. Uh, and that's sort of a course, and standard Young tableau correspond to paths in this graph of the subgraph y of delta n of Young's graph by a standard projection that I'm sure most of you know about. Um, and as for the graph on the left, the paths on that graph can be described combinatorially uh, as what we call sorting networks, although it goes by a, a bunch of other names that are more technical. Um, so a sorting network of order n is simply a path in the permutahedron connecting the identity permutation and the reverse permutation. So you, and you can graphically represent it here uh, as a diagram called a wiring diagram, which means, so here on the left, we have the identity permutation, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then you start perfor performing adjacent swaps and those are represented by crosses in the diagram um, until you get on the right-hand side to the permutation uh, six, five, four, three, two, one. So in a set of operations, a set of swaps that achieve that result. And remember, this is a directed graph, so we can only go forward, meaning the, there has to be exactly n choose two swaps to make this happen. So that's called the sorting network. Um, and those two sets are very strongly related to each other. So um, Stanley kind of proved the famous result uh, in 84, which is that those two sets are equinumerous. They have the same number of elements. So the number of standard uh, Young tableau of staircase shape is equal to the number of sorting networks of order n. Also, as a side remark, but it's not really important for my purposes, this number, we can actually enumerate it. You know, there's a, the Hoekling formula gives us a nice product formula for what this number is. But the main thing is that those two, the cardinality of those two sets are equal and Edelman and Green, a uh, short time later, found a very beautiful bijection between these two sets, and that's what uh, is now known as the Edelman-Green correspondence. Now, this is on the combinatorial side, but now I want to add a bit of probability to the discussion. Oh, yeah, maybe I should mention, these two examples of a sorting network and standard example are related to each other by the Edelman-Green bijection. And I will use these, refer to these examples again in the next few slides. So now to add a bit of probability, uh, what we call the corner growth process is uh, again, a simple random walk, except it usually refers to the simple random walk on the young graph of all young diagrams. So it's an infinite walk. It starts on the empty diagram and just adds boxes one at a time and keeps going forever. But for, my, for this talk, I just restrict my attention to those sub diagrams of the staircase shape of order N so that's kind of a family of walks indexed by a parameter n, but I still call it the corner growth process. Um, so that adds kind of a probability distribution on those, uh, on those walks. Um, and on the sorting network side, uh, I will, what we call the oriented swap process, and that's something that was introduced in a paper of mine with uh, Angel and Holroyd from 2009. That's a simple random walk on the permutahedron uh, Pn again, regarded as a directed graph. So again, that puts a probability measure on the set of sorting networks. So it's a specific case of what we call a random sorting network, but random sorting networks is a more general term because there are other interesting measures that people have studied um, on, this, um, on this set. And again, just to emphasize, I consider these two processes as continuous time processes. And the standard way of doing this is that each edge of the graph uh, is uh, labeled or associated with a random waiting time, which is an exponentially distributed waiting time with rate one. 
all of those times are IID independent of each other. And um, whenever you're at a vertex of the graph, you, you look for the, the edge, the outgoing edge that has the smallest waiting time and you go, you traverse that edge and you keep track of how long that took you. So that sort of adds the time parameterization. Okay, so now going back to my conjecture about Xn being equal in distribution to Yn, uh, there's actually a more detailed conjecture that this conjecture can be thought of as a, an immediate corollary of, uh, and that is an equality in distribution between two random vectors that I'll label Un and Vn, and I'll, I'll refer to them as finishing times because they sort of encode information about each of the two processes, the oriented swap process on one hand, and the corner growth process on the other hand, and they encode information about not just the, the total time that it took those two processes to finish, but some kind of extra information about the way that happened or uh, when various things uh, stopped happening along the way. So in uh, the vector un is associated uh, with the oriented swap process and the kth coordinate, which I label un of k, uh, describe it is defined as the last time when you saw a swap happening between positions k and k plus one. You know, for each k, you can keep track of that uh, the last time when you saw that happening, and you package those numbers into a vector. And similarly, for v n k, for v the vector v n, the kth coordinate is the last time when, or the the time when your box in the kth position along the diagonal of the staircase shape, meaning in position n minus k comma k, uh, was filled. So those are two vectors that carry in that kind of inf finishing information. Uh, here's just a quick example. Now, to give you an example, I would need to actually give a continuous time realization of these two processes, but I don't wanna do that. So let's just stick to discrete time. In the discrete time, you can think of uh, the standard Young tableau from my running example in the sorting network as being discrete time realizations of those simple random walks. So for the standard Young tableau, I mean, it's probably too small to see, but it's the same example from the previous slide. So you can look back if you want to see. The vector Vn is simply the vector of numbers along the diagonal. So 10, 13, 15, 14, 11. So that's easy to see. Um, for the sorting network, if you, if you think about that as an instance of the oriented swap process with discrete time, then you can check that the vector un will also be equal to 10, 13, 15, 14, 11. So I'll leave that to you to check. You have to kind of stare at this diagram for a bit. Uh, the fact that these two vectors are equal is kind of nice. And remember, I said that they are related to each other by the Edelman-Green correspondence. So, this is a general phenomena that whenever you have a pair of stand, uh, standard Young tableau and sorting network that are related to each other via Edelman Green, you can check that those two vectors are going to be the same. So that's a kind of a lemma, but a very easy one. Um, but more interestingly, uh, going back to the continuous time world, which is a more interesting world to think about, we have the following conjecture that for all n, the vectors un and vn, as I define them, are equidistributed, uh, meaning they have the same joint distribution. Now, um, note that this implies the original conjecture that I started with about xn and yn, because xn is simply the maximum of the coordinates of un, because the xn is the total the, the time for the process to terminate, but there had to be a specific k when that last swap occurred in those positions, k and k plus one. And similarly, yn, the total time to fill the staircase shape in the corner growth process will be the maximum of the coordinates of vn of k because it's the maximum time when one of the positions in the diagonal was filled. So now, um, now can we hope for this, such a conjecture be, to be true? Well, here's just a small sanity check. You know, it's consistent with something that we already know to be true, which is from my paper with Angel and Horrod, we know, and it's not a very hard thing to, to explain, so we understand it quite well, that for each coordinate k, the, the k coordinate un of k has the same distribution as vn of k. So that, that much is known, but note that that is a much weaker statement. So here we're saying something about the joint distribution of un and vn. So it's much stronger and more difficult to prove. And in fact, this conjecture is still open. So we still don't understand why it's true. 
there's, there's definitely something interesting going on that needs to be explained. Okay, uh, what can we say about it? Well, I can say several things about it. The first thing I wanna say is to tie it back more to algebraic combinatorics is we can take this probabilistic identity and recast it as a, uh, as a purely combinatorial statement uh, through a series of manipulations that basically I will summarize it as just taking a Fourier transform because that's one step. Um, so it's an equality between generating functions. Uh, so here it is in its uh, full glory. It's, it's a bit detailed, so I, I won't go into all the details, but basically there are two generating functions. So the theorem says that this conjecture un equal in distribution to vn has an equivalent form as an equality between generating functions fn and gn. They are multivariate functions, so they have n minus one variables because un and vn have n minus one coordinates. And also they are vector valued. So each, each generating function has n minus one factorial components. Basically it lives in the free vector space generated by permutations of order n minus one, if you want to think about it that way. And each component of, that, of those generating function is a rational function in these indeterminate variables, x1 through xn minus one. Now, how are these two generating functions defined? Um, each one is defined as a sum over the respective set of combinatorial elements that sort of that random walk lives on. So fn is a sum over standard Young tableau of staircase shape and gn is a sum over sorting networks. The thing that you're sum, uh, so that's why I say it's, this identity is basically a kind of weighted vector valued generalization of Stanley's original sort of theorem about the two sets being um, equinumerous. So we're just, it's like a weighted version of that. So uh, what are we summing in each of the sums? In the, on the left-hand side, we're summing an expression of the form ft of x1 through xn minus one. So that would be an ordinary rational function, a scalar one, but that it gets multiplied by the vector uh, associated with some permutation, which I label sigma t. So ft is what I call the generating factor, factor of t, sigma t is what I call the finishing permutation of t. And I'll show a quick example in the next slide, but I won't get into the precise definition, so you can look it up in the paper. Um, and then on the right-hand side, we have something analogous where each sorting network sort of, you can use it to calculate some data, which is the generating factor g sub, g sub s and the finishing permutation pi sub s. And then the claim is that when you do these complicated sums, then you get things that are equal on both sides. Um, and that's equivalent to our conjecture. So let me show a quick example. Again, with the same pair S and T that we saw before in the running example. Uh, remember that the vectors UN and VN there were 10, 13, 15, 14, 11. And that's how you derive those permutations, sigma T and pi S. They just maintain information about the order structure of those vectors UN and VN. So, you forget the number and you just remember their ordering and that gives you the permutation one, three, five, four, two for both sigma t and pi s. And then the generating factors f t and g s, if you know what their definition is, which I'm not going into, you can calculate them and you get, it's basically just a product of lin, uh, linear factors or one over a linear factor. So it's one over polynomial in these variables x1 through x5. Um, and the thing to note, is that the permutations are equal. So sigma t is equal to pi s. And as I said, that is a lemma that it, this holds generally um, by Edelman Green. But the generating factors are not the same. So it's not the case in this identity between f and gn that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. You can't sort of uh, trivially apply Edelman Green and say that each factor here maps to the, another factor here. Therefore, this is true. I and mean, that's an obvious thing to try. But, we, but it doesn't work. And not only that, but there isn't a bijection that makes it work because you, you really have to add things up to make these two sums uh, come out as equal to each other. So there's, there's something that's sort of more mysterious than Edelman Green going on. Okay, well, the, another thing that uh, this uh, kind of re reformulation lets us do is at least we can check the conjecture now explicitly for specific values of n. So that's what we did. We coded everything up in Mathematica and you can download the code if you want from my website. And you can, um, that allows us to check that those two generating functions are equal and therefore the identity 
is true, at least for small values of n. So we, we got as high as n equals six. And you know, in theory, if I wanted to, I could probably do n equals seven, but there's no point. So the point is this gives us very compelling evidence that this conjecture is true. I hope it's sufficiently convincing that people will actually believe it and try to, to do something about it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so for the last part of the talk, I wanna mention a third identity. Uh, so again, in the same class of identities, so involving a and yet another vector, which I'll label WN, and it turns out that WN actually has the same distribution as both UN and VN, or at least conjecturally. Well, we were, to, we were at least able to prove that it has the same, conject, uh, same distribution as VN. And in fact, it's related to VN in the sense that it appears as a kind of dual vector to VN. But, but that fact is, is still quite interesting and brings up some interesting combinatorics. Um, so I have to define WN. And that definition is sort of a little bit more subtle because it, it, it doesn't have a simple definition as a involving a random walk or a random growth process. So you have to first of all look back at VN and reinterpret it as a vector of what's called last passage percolation times. So those of you who do probability a lot probably have heard of this, but uh, it's less well known to combinatorialists and I won't go into all the details, but the last passage times are a family of random variables that look like L of A, B, C, D, where A, B, and C, D are lattice points on the lattice N squared. And to define L of A, B, C, D is basically given by this picture where you look at all monotone paths going from A, B to C, D. And for each path, you compute a kind of weight associated with this path that is obtained by summing up a bunch of IID exponential rate one random variables along the path. So each vertex in this lattice has a, such a random variable associated with it. And you take the maximum over all such paths and that gives you what we call the last, uh, what's called the last passage percolation time. Um, and with that definition, it's, no, it's known from the standard theory that the, what I defined as the vector Vn can actually be redefined in terms of these times by the following formula, which you can ignore because there's a picture and I always prefer pictures to formulas. So the picture says you look at all the last passage percolation times between the corner of the stand of the staircase diagram and the diagonal points. And that's the vector Vn. So by analogy with that, I can define the vector Wn where I just flip vertically, uh, flip each of those two pairs of uh, vertices. So that gives me another vector, which I label Wn, and that's the formula for it. But the, the picture sort of tells, explains it better. And again, a priori, there's no obvious reason to explain that Vn and Wn will be very related to each other, but that ends up happening. And that is in fact a theorem. So we have proved that Vn and Wn are equal in distribution for all n. So again, there's three interesting vectors. They all have the same distribution, but in one case, we can't actually, haven't been able to prove it. As a sanity check, in this case, it's actually really trivial that the kth coordinate, the marginal, the one dimensional marginal of these vectors are equal to each other just by reflection. Um, and just to, you know, one paragraph summary of the proof is that this is a place where some really interesting combinatorics comes up. So we use a version of the RSK correspondence and also the Burge correspondence. It's not quite the standard version. It basically dates back to the work of Kratenthaler from 2006. Uh, also kind of reformulated in more recent work by B.C. O'Connell and Ziguras. Um, so first you, you go to a discrete setting where you replace the exponential random variables by geometric ones. And then th those uh, vectors Vn and W basically arise as a kind of a n minus one dimensional marginals of those output tableau of uh, output by Burge and RSK. And then it can be shown that these two tableau are equidistributed. And actually this is a more general result uh, that applies to other uh, shapes, not just to a staircase shape. Once you know that everything kind of comes out. So it's a very short proof once you actually know the existence of these maps. And then you take a limit to get exponential weights, although it can be done directly in the exponential setting if you really want to. So, that's the main thing I wanted to say. And if a few closing remarks is 
Uh, in more recent work, as I mentioned, uh, with Bufetov and Gorin, we actually proved that this conjecture about X and YN is true using completely different methods related to the TASAP. Um, we tried to apply those methods to the stronger conjecture about UN and VN, but we didn't get anywhere. So that's still open. And I think, you know, a kind of conjecture that will appeal to many of the people here. Uh, and another thing is that one of the motiv strong motivations for working on this is for asymptotics. So we're interested in asymptotics of Xn as n goes to infinity and using this relationship between Xn and Yn, um, we can, it's, the asymptotics for Yn is known and therefore we can get the asymptotics for Xn and it converges to the tracy widom GOE distribution F1. And that was actually an open problem from my paper with uh, Angel and Holroyd. So that's basically it. Here are some references. Uh, thank you all. I'll see you all at FIPSAC 2021, hopefully. And finally, I really want to give a very big, big thanks uh, on, on behalf of all speakers to the organizers of uh, FIPSAC 2020. And I'm supposed to turn off the screen share so that we can all applaud you. because it's been a really fun experience and uh, hopefully in 2021 we can uh, can have an in-person meeting so that's it um, thank you Dan so let's thank Dan and now uh, the other Dan are there questions that were unanswered in the chat uh, there are couple of questions so so sarah sarah asked about uh, the birch correspondence and uh, while i know the answer maybe you want to explain it uh, uh, can, can you so so th there is a comment by sarah which says that we sh i should have interrupted you a minute ago to to explain the birch correspondence okay so i'll interrupt you now um I um, I admit I actually don't um, understand the Birch correspondence very well. I mean, the these constructions that we're using came uh, were new to me. I didn't I wasn't familiar with uh, this particular version of RSK and Birch. I mean, now I'm a bit more familiar, so I think they're really beautiful. But um, in Krattenthaler's paper, um, he actually refers to it as I think dual RSK prime. So it's one of uh, several variants of RSK. It was introduced originally by, uh, in a paper by Burge. And I, I'm sort of not sufficiently familiar with the history to, to talk about it. Is the right but place to look it up in Crotton Dollar's paper then? It depends which version you want. So there's the paper by Burge, there's the paper by Crotton Teller, and there's the paper by BC, O'Connell, and Ziguras. Uh, and kind of each one uses a very different language to describe it. So it's actually not immediately recognizable that these are the same correspondences. Okay. So I, the chat's I, going crazy here. So maybe somebody will put a reference in the, in the chat. Yeah, I can put a reference. I also have an appendix to one of my papers where I explain this in the max plus construction. And it's really just RSK where you do column insertion instead of row insertion, but, uh, but it's not dual RSK. It's, uh, yeah. It's and it's also RSK in the- prime. It's well explained in the appendix of Fulton's book. I think appendix B2 of uh, Young Tableau by Fulton. I think it's B2, it could be B4. Um, Dan, can you link your paper? Uh, the paper uh, it, it, it's a paper the... called GOE squared on the archive. I only have one paper with GOE squared in the title. When people What's say Dan, clear? they should uh, make clear which Dan they're Oh, from. sorry. <laughs> ah, the, the other, sorry, yeah. So if it's, uh, if you're talking about uh, the other Dan, uh, yes, so uh, can you link your paper? Uh, so now I'm getting papers questions. are linked at the end of the oh, slide. I, I, I was talking about you. I, I, I want to see a Birch defined in rational terms. Uh, yeah, so uh, just Google GOE squared on the archive. I mean, archive GOE squared. Because I also have to ask the questions at the same time. Uh, ben Young says it's in Fulton's book as well. I think we covered that. 
uh, Sheila Sandoram gives the link to Burge's paper, or at least the title. Mark van Leeuwen has a paper on it, that's also true. Uh, now I have to scroll up because there were a couple of other questions. Uh, let's, Richard Stanley has one. Uh, Richard, do you want to unmute yourself to, uh, to ask it? If not, I can ask it. Okay, I can ask. Um... So I'm wondering if you know, your results deal with walks from the uh, identity element up to uh, W0 permutation. And I'm wondering if they extend to walks in the permutahedron from the identity element to a vexillary permutation of shape lambda compared to walks in Young's lattice from the empty shape to lambda. So we haven't explored that. It would be very interesting to, to see if they extend uh, in such a way, so I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Cyril Bonderier also has a question. Cyril, do you want to unmute yourself? Oh, hello. yes. So Dan, uh, yes, you just said there is a, a creative vector valued version of the equation results. Uh, I can't hear you very well. Uh, okay. Maybe because you're holding your sweater above your face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so do you think that there is a kind of uh, weighted vector-valued version of the equation results for the razumov stroganov conjecture and the alternate sign matrix conjecture? Uh, <laughs> model and so on. There might be, I, I don't know. Um, do you have a specific, oh, this, uh, I, you know, idea of what kind of weighting or what kind of vector? Multivariate versions, uh, more than two or three parameters for sure. Yeah, the, yeah, uh, I have no idea. That would be extremely and, interesting, obviously. Um, but I haven't really thought about it. Uh, all right, we arguably have a whole year left for questions. So uh, anybody else who has a question knows the, well, now and a year, uh, up to a year from now. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Uh, maybe I'll ask a quick question. So the GOE, uh, GOE result that you have is just the point to line last passage percolation, right? So that's... Uh, yeah, so... Yeah, the, there's those two variables, xn and yn. Yn is basically point to line right. last passage population, and that's known to converge to G, uh, f1. And because of our new result, then that thing that says the same thing about xn, about the absorbing time of the origin and swap process. Uh, so Sam also has a question. Sorry about this, but I didn't see it because there are many comments in the chat, so it's kind of hard to scroll the, up and down. Sam, is that true? Yeah, my question is just, uh, do you get any interesting symmetries um, in, in the probabilistic side of things from the promotion operation on Tableau? Um, yes, but it's sort of not really related to this talk. It's, um, so there, there's a, another interesting model for random sorting networks called, called uniform sorting networks, where you pick your uh, growth sequence or, um, or random paths from the identity to the reverse permutation uh, uniformly at random. And the oriented swap process is very much not uniform. But anyway, that uniform measure is actually extremely interesting. There have been a bunch of papers written about that. And I think if I understand what you're asking, uh, the promotion operator is a kind of symmetry on that set of uh, sorting network. It's, it, it causes like a cy cyclical shift in the um, in the set of transpositions and uh, it kind of shows up there. I mean, I don't know, does it, so, so it, it has a, a certain role to play in the study of those uniform sorting networks. You can look at those papers. All right, I don't see any other questions. Well, I might have quite a few of them, but I can ask uh, Dan in private. Uh, there is a, comment in the chat about the paper of Vic Reiner about this. 
Uh, okay, so let's thank Dan again, and then I'll give it back to Matyash. So let's thank all the speakers of today and actually all the speakers of the conference.